Right now on Who's Your News Source, several people were wounded in a series of shootings over the Little 500 weekend. Learn more about the police investigation. And we have the latest on the ongoing graduate worker strike with a message from the provost. And I have updates on a temperature outlook for the summer and this week's weather. Who's Your News Source starts now. Hello and welcome to the season 25 finale of Who's Your News Source. I'm Elizabeth DeSantis. Bloomington police are still investigating two shootings over the weekend that sent four people to the hospital. The first shooting occurred just after 1 a.m. on Saturday inside Kalau nightclub on North Walnut Street. Police say three men inside the nightclub suffered gunshot wounds. 20 minutes later, police responded to a different shooting in an alley just a few blocks away. Here's what we know right now. The victims of the shootings at Kalau were 41, 26, and 22 years old. The victim of the alleyway shooting was 26 and suffered gunshot wounds to the abdomen. He remains in critical condition. Although police initially said three suspects were in custody, they have since said those suspects are not connected to the shooting. Investigators have also not determined if the two shootings are connected. Anyone with information on either shooting is asked to call the corresponding numbers on your screen. On Monday, Provost Raul Srivastav sent out an email to student academic appointees. In the email, the provost reiterated the recent commitments the university has made to improve graduate education and also endorsed the reinstatement of the SAA Committee of the Bloomington Faculty Council. In concluding the email, he said, quote, to those of you who have chosen to stop work in the last few weeks, please consider your ethical and contractual obligations to your students and ensure that you complete your SAA responsibilities. You can do so confidently knowing that your voices have been heard, that your efforts have already resulted in substantive changes, and that you are helping all of us build new and better programs and initiatives at IU Bloomington. You have my personal commitment to continued support in the future." End quote. Yesterday, grad student workers voted to continue their strike for a third week. Every graduate student worker has a different reason for going on strike. For one Hoosier, it was being left with no money after an unexpected procedure. h &S reporter Ashton Hackman has more. I had to resort to borrowing money from other people to help me get by. Musa Hassan is an international graduate student worker at IU. He joined the strike after an unexpected medical procedure derailed his finances. I had to get a root canal and the dental insurance that is provided to us through um, the university does not adequately cover for those sorts of procedures. Hassan says wages alone is not the only problem. The insurance is itself inadequate. The stipends that we get paid are such that in most situations, a lot of graduate workers and especially a lot of international graduate workers will be left struggling from month to month. Hassan says his experience of struggling to make ends meet is the reason that he thinks the university should recognize the union. This is exactly why we need to have a union to advocate for us because the situation is not going to improve on its own. For now, Musa will continue to strike with graduate student workers. For Who's Your News Source, I'm Ashton Hackman. As we approach the end of the semester, it's unclear what plans there may be to keep the strike going over the summer or into the fall. The annual Little 500 bike races were held this past weekend with spectators in attendance for the first time since 2019. The women's race took place on Friday with riders having to complete 100 laps around the track at Bill Armstrong Stadium. The Melanzana cycling team finished with an end time of 1 hour, 14 minutes, and 15 seconds to win the women's race. Kappa Alpha Theta came in second, and Alpha Chi Omega placed third. The men's race took place on Saturday afternoon, and it ended in dramatic fashion with a crash occurring on the second to last lap. The race would continue to a close finish as Phi Data Theta took the victory with a time of 2 hours, 15 minutes, and 43.47 seconds. Second and third place were not far behind with Sigma Phi Epsilon having a time of 2 hours, 15 minutes, and 43.66 seconds. And Jet Black having a time of 2 hours, 15 minutes, 43.78 seconds. 
The biggest collegiate bike race in America this weekend in Bloomington did not disappoint. Kayla Craig now joins us with this week's weather forecast. Kayla. Thanks, Elizabeth. Across the country, many areas are expected to have above average temperatures this summer. Much of the western U.S. and the east coast are likely to be hotter than average, especially in the Four Corners region. The west coast and upper midwest areas, including Indiana, are expected to see average summer temperatures. Now let's take a look at today's forecast. Today we're in for some sunny spring weather. We reach our high of 61 at around 4 p.m. with a slight breeze, and temperatures will fall as some clouds come out and the sun goes down. Let's see what to expect for the rest of the week. Rain chances return to our area beginning late Thursday night into the weekend with daily storm chances from Saturday into Monday. While we don't know exactly when this cold front will come through, temperatures overall will stay in the 50s and 60s as we head into finals week. Stay safe, good luck on your finals, and have a great summer. Elizabeth, back to you. Coming up on Who's Your News Source, we have more on the premiere of an IU Journalism professor's new documentary series and learn important information about the upcoming midterm election primaries. Stay with us. Welcome back. A media school faculty member is using her journalistic experience to help solve a nine year long mystery that took place in her hometown of Columbus, Indiana. HNS reporter Jack Lindner has more. Outside her teaching position at the media school, journalist Cheryl Ousley Jackson is using her years of experience to help expose the truth on the most important story of her career. This past Thursday, the Columbus Learning Center was home to the premiere of Jackson's latest project a nine-part documentary series about the life and death of her brother, Carrie Ousley. The docuseries, titled Who Killed Carrie Ousley? A Mission for Justice, explores the unusual circumstances surrounding Ousley's death, which was originally ruled a suicide in 2013. Jackson's investigation, however, has led her to believe that her brother was actually murdered. I believe the youngest son, who was in his late 20s at the time, uh, he was trying to move in. My brother was telling me the day before he's not moving in here till I move out. Um, and I think they fought. I feel like this uh, person has a lot of um, emotional issues, and I believe he shot him. During her investigation, Jackson has worked with numerous experts to review her brother's case, including Dr. Bill Smock, a forensics expert who was called as a witness during the George Floyd murder trial. Residents of Columbus, Indiana gathered to watch the series' first episode and to engage in a Q&A session with Jackson and her partner in this project, former WTHR anchor Andrea Moorhead. During the Q&A session, Jackson stated that she intends to pitch the documentary to a major streaming service such as Netflix or Hulu in hopes of giving her brother's story a wide release. One of Jackson's hopes with the documentary is that it will help move her brother's case to court, where it can finally be heard in front of a jury. As I teach my students all the time, I believe the light of the press drives light to the truth. So the more press we have, the more chance we have for truth. While there still is a long way to go, Jackson believes that this documentary is an important milestone in a nine-year-long mission for justice. For Who's Your News Source, I'm Jack Lindner. Jackson also stated that if the documentary does not get picked up by a major streaming service, she will continue to present each episode to the public on her own. Indiana is quickly approaching primary election day as voters prepare to elect nine U.S. representatives and one U.S. senator. Indiana allows for early in-person voting with all registered voters allowed to vote 28 days before the election. Early voting will close on May 2nd at noon and specific early voting hours in locations vary by county. More information regarding these specifics can be found at indianavoters.in.gov. For voters who are not planning on voting early, primary election day is Tuesday, May 3rd. Candidate information can be found at ballotpedia.org. A Kelly School of Business Center has received a $1 million donation from an alumnus to support healthcare related and life science programs. The Center for the Business of Life Sciences is meant to prepare students for careers in areas like healthcare systems, medical devices, biotechnology, and more. Jeff Albers, who graduated in 1993, said he hopes to encourage more students to be exposed to life sciences and be a benefit to society in that field. He is the former CEO and current chair of Blueprint Medicines, which develops therapies for those with cancers and blood disorders. HNS reporter Carly Rasmussen joins us with the latest on international news from around the world. Carly? 
Thanks, Elizabeth. Norwegian Greenpeace activists are blocking Russian oil taker Asta Luga from entering the port with kayaks and boats. The peaceful protest is taking place in the Adlo Fjord, an oil port owned by ESSO, a Norwegian subsidi subsidiary of U.S.-based ExxonMobil. Activists are calling on the Norwegian government to ban the import of Russian oil and for ESSO to cancel their contracts that allow them to buy fossil fuels from Russia during this time of war. Activists in a boat have chained themselves to the boat's anchor chain to prevent the Asaluga from going to pier and offloading the oil. The vessel is loaded with 95,000 tons of jet kerosene with an estimated value of 116 million U.S. dollars. And moving over to Ukraine, Russian missile strikes killed seven people in the Ukrainian city of Lviv on Monday morning. A preliminary assessment showed that the strikes were launched from airplanes that came from the direction of the Caspian Sea. Officials are also reporting that 11 other people were injured in the strikes that hit a military warehouse and a commercial automobile service station. The city had been a spot of refuge for displaced Ukrainians for its location in the quiet west. Even over the Easter weekend, families had been going to church services and taking evening strolls with flower bouquets. Since Monday, that is no longer the case. Lviv Mayor Andra Saduvi said, quote, And today in Ukraine, there are no safe and unsafe cities, end quote. Now in Beijing, a COVID-19 outbreak has been seen spreading over the capital for a week. As numbers continue to rise, it is possible that the city could be under more restrictions. Xiao Yang announced on Sunday that the city will be launching three rounds of mass testing for those who work and live in the district. These residents are under control management, according to state media, meaning they cannot leave the area without undergoing testing. The district is expected to face disruptions to work and business. In Shanghai, the city reported more than 19,000 new cases and 51 deaths on Sunday, even following their failed weeks-long lockdown. And that's all for this week's Around the World. Elizabeth, back to you. Thanks, Carly. And thank you for watching this week's episode of Who's Your News Source. Be sure to follow us on Instagram and Twitter at IUSTV News. I'm Elizabeth DeSantis. From Bloomington, Indiana, we'll see you next time.